Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media. This is Yesha Yahu, where we bring you the gospel of Yahusha HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, to address the problems of a modern world. And today's topics, the Ark of the Covenant, spoils of war, and the Lateran Church in Rome. Remember that name. Exodus chapter 25, verse 10. And they shall make an ark of shittim wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Welcome back, family. We're going to continue on this topic and uh, learn some more about the whereabouts of the Ark of the Covenant. And I think you'll find this kind of interesting because, you know, it's fallen into myth like it never existed or it just vanished into thin air. But the question is, did it? And so there's all sorts of theories. So Exodus chapter 25 and verse 11 and thou shalt overlay it with pure gold within and without shalt thou overlay it and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about. So this thing is overlaid on the outside with pure gold and within it's overlaid within with pure gold and it has a crown round about and is very symbolic. So the actual ark is made of wood which stands is symbolic once you understand the scriptures, you know that wood is symbolic of humanity. In other words, a man. Gold is symbolic for righteousness. And so this man is covered within and without with righteousness. And he has a crown of gold. Makes him a king. I wonder who that could be. So, you know, some might ask, is it, does it even matter where the ark is? Well, more it does in this sense. It matters in that it's almost like a, a time mechanism, an alarm clock. So there's things that it, when you understand about its, its travels, in a sense, it can pinpoint, it can point out who's who and what's what in, in the space of time, inside the space-time continuum. And I'm going to start using that term a lot more, and there's a reason I'm going to start using that term a lot more. Most people, you know, they think that's a, just a purely a physics term, but it's an observational term. It t tells you that anything that is finite is essentially within this space-time continuum. Anything that is infinite, infinite, is outside this system. So that's another topic for another day, but um, that's a very important concept to grasp. And so I'm going to dig into it uh, in various videos. Exodus chapter 25, verse 20. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. And their faces shall look one to another. Towards the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And the, and the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. So this ark, which symbolizes hum, uh, a human man who's overlaid with gold, righteousness, inside and out. He has a crown of gold. And he has the ark of the testimony within him. See, this is all pointing towards the Messiah. The ark is symbolizing the Messiah. So let's uh, giddy up and continue on and see where we can where this all leads. And Exodus 25, verse 22. And there I will meet with thee 
and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. Hmm, interesting. From between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony, of all things which I give thee, in commandment unto the children of Israel. So again, this ark thing, he's, the Most High says he will commune with you. So doesn't that, if the ark is symbolic of the Messiah, doesn't that tell you he is the way? This is the point where the Most High will commune with you. And, I, you know, when you go into the New Testament and you read all that the Messiah says, yes, he is the way. He's the gate. You know what I'm saying? He's the door. And so if you want to commune with Yahweh, the Most High, you must commune through his son, Yahweh Shah, Yahusha. And, and, and listen to the way I put that together. It's very important that you understand because I'm going to dig into why it's so important to actually know his name. Because even to this day, there are certain things that become real obvious in the scriptures once you start using his name. And, and it's, it's, I mean, it becomes obvious. If you keep using these wrong names, you totally cannot see it. And, and it's funny because even the so-called experts, you know, rabbis have been arguing about this forever, right? And, uh, and I'm not going to get to it in this video, but if you don't know his name, you can't put two and two together. You cannot do it. And so, like I say, you have to go back to the beginning, get it right, and then the scriptures start to open up to you. If you do not do that, you'll continue in your old era. And it won't make sense. Like, it hasn't made sense for 2,000 years. And people kind of blow it off like, eh, it must have been like something we're not supposed to know. Or, it, you know, they, they just brush it under the rug. But there's certain things that come to light once you understand that the father's name is Yahweh and the son's name is Yahweh Shah. That gets deep. Okay? So just keep that in mind and we'll, we'll get to it eventually. Um, I think I'll put that in book format probably because there's a lot to talk about there. So let's keep giddy up. Giddy up. <clears throat> the spoils of war so in, in part two we kind of went into what the Babylonians did but now the Romans do it and they besieged Jerusalem and you know in uh, 70 AD and they and there, there was a breach and they entered the city and they started killing people it was no joke I mean, we, we think of war today. War today is kind of impersonal. I mean, you drop a smart bomb on somebody. You don't know how many people you killed. You didn't see their faces. You didn't see the look of horror on their faces. But back then, it was face to face, nose to nose. And it took energy to bludgeon someone to death with an axe, with a mace, with a sword. And the Romans were expert at it. But even then, um, the, the Jews had shown their worth in, in previous uh, centuries, meaning Judah Maccabee, he, uh, he kicked butt. So the Jews were no weak people. And they, with Jerusalem being, being a fortified city, the Romans, it says the Romans got there, looked at the walls of the city and went, oh my God, you know, like even they were taken aback. But because the spirit wasn't correct in the Jewish people, or I shouldn't say Jewish people, I know, I know, sorry, I apologize. But the spirit was not correct within the Yahudim, the Judeans, once we get the term Jew. Um, they, they're infighting in the city. They, they had civil war in the city. You know, they started fighting each other in the city over, over, who was running the show and the Romans are looking at it like what's going on in the city I mean they're, like they're killing each other you know it was a big mess had they been right 
like under the Maccabees, where they had a, a, a warrior leader who knew tactics, they could have held out against the Romans for years, and the Romans knew that. But it was the, you know, I don't care the, the, who watches the gate. Unless the Lord the city keeps, they maintain a useless vigil. You know, that's, that's scripture. And so in this case, it was meant for them to lose. Yah was not with them. And so they lost. So we go here to uh, a book called The Wars of the Jews. Book 7, chapter 5, verse 5. Um, these are the writings of uh, Flavius Josephus. And a lot of people are down on Josephus because they call him, some people call him a traitor. And I can see why they would say that, you know. But I don't know. And to be honest with you, I don't really even care. It's just that you have a guy who's writing, who lived at that time, who's writing about that time, which makes his writings invaluable. I mean, it's incredible how much detail he goes into. So here we go. On the top of every one of these pageants, so the Romans, after they defeated an enemy, they would actually stage a parade for the people to show them all the spoils of war and how they defeat. They would almost have a, they would almost act it out like a Broadway play, but it'd be in the streets and it'd be a parade. And then each float, it would show some act of valor uh, that the Romans, you know, accomplished. And they would actually have the actual slaves they'd taken on these floats. And so they would show, see, yeah, this, this commander and this general, he withstood us here, but we conquered him. And they'd show a little, you know, have a little act out, little plays on the floats. But it was like a big deal. So the victory was a huge deal. Not only this, everyone knew Jerusalem had a reputation. It was like, wow, we were able to conquer Jerusalem. That was no small feat. That was a well-known fortified city. And the Jews had a reputation for being fierce warriors for their beliefs. And, and that's borne out through the Maccabees. At the time of the Maccabees, when Judah Maccabee was leading um, their revolt against the Greeks, the, the, you know, he had sent emissaries to Rome because he wanted to uh, form an alliance with Rome against the Greeks. And the Romans were like all on board with it because they had heard of the valor of Judah Maccabee. I mean, this man was world renowned for his valor. This is no joke. Just because you haven't heard of him, you know, history is funny. Like I say, his story, you know, who gets to write history? But Judah Maccabee was the man. So anyway, they're having these great parades and they're marching the slaves through the streets and the floats through the streets. And uh, let's continue. Okay, we're still in the Wars of the Jews. Uh, book 7, chapter 5, verse 5. But for those that were taken in the temple of Jerusalem, they made the greatest figure of them all. Okay, so they, in the parade, they made the greatest figure of them all. It means, I guess they really wanted to point out that yeah, these are the guys that were in charge and this is what we did, you know. That is the golden table of the weight of many talents, the candlestick, meaning the menorah also, that was made of gold. So they were showing all the golden objects that they took out of the temple before they leveled it. You know, what, what did the Messiah say? Not one brick would be left upon another. Yeah, the Romans fulfilled that prophecy big time. And so they saw these gold objects. And, and more than that, the temple at the time was like a bank. Uh, they stored all sorts of gold coins and gold objects. It was a treasury. And so the Romans came in there and they said, well, we're taking it all. And they took it all back to Rome. And here they never mentioned the Ark of the Covenant, which makes one think. We know when the Babylonians came in, 
Jeremiah, the prophet, he, and I believe Jeremiah was also a Levite, if memory serves, but they got, took the ark and hid it. But when Nehemiah and Ezra and Nehemiah came back, it kind of alludes to the fact that they found the fire again, which kind of alludes to the fact that they found the ark where Jeremiah had hid it and brought it back to Jerusalem. They never come out and say that exactly, but I think they did. And so that argument, because it never really actually says they found it, but they they allude to it. You know, Jeremiah also hid the fire, and I'm whatever that is. You know, the fire, and he hid the ark, and and the uh, tabernacle. And they seem like they all found this stuff and brought it back to Jerusalem. So here the Romans come back and they sack the city and take all these gold objects, and they don't mention the ark. I mean, that's the weirdest thing. That's like the main thing. But they do mention all these other items, which if the ark was there, you would have to assume it was also taken. And maybe they didn't know what it was. They just knew it was a big golden box. But the the candelabra, the menorah, was an odd shape, and I guess it captured their uh, attention because of its oddness. But yet it was made of pure gold, so they're like, yep, we're taking this thing. And they make mention of it. Now, Josephus, being a Jew, that there might just be a thing said. Like, he might know it was there, but it, would, it might be like a thing where we don't want the Romans to know that that's our main object. So we'll keep it on the down low and not mention it and keep an eye on it. And, and they did, because all these things were taken to a temple. And let's, let's dig a little deeper because it gets more interesting as we go on. So it says in the book 7, chapter 5, verse 5, though its construction were now changed from that which we made use of, for its middle shaft was fixed upon a basis, and the small branches were produced out of it to a great length, having the likeness of a trident in their position and had every one a socket made of brass for a lamp at the tops of them. So they formed it uh, in their parade. Um, They kind of made, a, um, I guess, a mock image of it. Um, And it looked more like a trident, which I think all the Romans would understand if they saw it. They said, a trident? Oh, my goodness, Poseidon's trident. You know, so I think uh, that was the attempt there. But they were showing that this is one of the things that they had captured. And so, you know, we can take, uh, we can take heed of that. So let's continue on. But just remember, this Josephus guy, he was a historian, and he put this down in great detail. So we shouldn't just blow it off. And uh, he continues... These lamps were in number seven and represented the dignity of the number seven among the Jews. Remember I told you the number seven, the Bible's all symbolic. The number seven stands for perfection, not completion. A lot of people, they'll say, oh, number seven represents completion. No, the number three represents completion. The number seven is when Yah said, and it was very good, right? his whole creation, right? So the number seven, he perfected it. So seven represents perfection. Um, And the last of all the spoils was carried the law of the Jews. Wait a minute. Okay. And they're talking parchments. They're talking the actual ark, which contained the stone tablets. They don't really get into it, but he started getting the... mm, yeah, this, that could indicate that they had the ark. After these spoils passed by, a great many men carrying the images of victory, whose structure was entirely either of ivory or gold. So they're putting it on thick, you know. <laughs> they're making sure everybody can see all the great things that they captured and their victories, which again was typical of the Romans. And we'll keep going. Um, 
but but you you can see here where the Bible is. Uh, yeah, you can you you can understand a lot this the important stuff, but Yah also the Most High pro provides us with other testimonies, historical references, like for instance the stone of Sennacherib out in the the desert of uh, what was it out of Mosul or Nineveh near what was called Nineveh is today called Mosul. Um, so they had the stone of Sennacherib, which talks about the uh, besieging of Jerusalem and Hezekiah by name. So you know these are just historical. It's not some made-up story. Like I, I think people still, you know, the detractors still try to say, oh, the Bible is myth. No, we, we got monuments by other countries. And then there was the Moabite stone, which talks about the defeat of Israel. I mean, by name, calling it out. So it's, it's good to look at these historical references because it starts to, you start to get into the mind of what people were actually thinking and what actually transpired and how it transpired. Okay, so it's important. Don't just write these things off. Like, I'm not reading that. Yeah, but you'll read comic books. Yeah, but you won't read this? Come on now. My, my pastor told me not to read that. It might confuse me. Yeah, but you could play Fortnite. And is that not confusing? I'm just saying. It's like the devil can twist your brain up to where you can find it all right to watch soap operas but not read Josephus? Really? Come on, people. You got to ask the question. If the devil wants to twist things up, he's not going to be obvious with it. He's going to be like, well... Let me confuse them on the name of the Most High. We don't want, it, want them saying the name. That's how powerful the name is. You got people still calling him G-O-D, God, God. It's not his name. Uh, and, and the Son of God, his name, if you went back in time and you were looking for the Messiah and you said, has anybody seen Jesus? They would look at you like, what? Who's that? If, if you saw him and you said, hey, Jesus, he wouldn't even turn around because he would not understand what you were saying because his name is not Jesus, it's Yahusha. He would understand that. And so, you know, I saw a video the other day that had me laughing of all the stuff people come up with. And that's just the devil that he can twist up common sense to that level. His name is not Jesus. That was made up. Now, what I do is I'll, I'll say the name Jesus because people will understand what I'm saying. So unless you're grounded in, in, in the, doc, the, the strong doctrine of the scriptures, you know, and even if you're, you know a lot of words and, and you've memorized a lot of passages, there's still that bias. Well, I'm still not giving up the name Jesus. I'm still not going to stop saying God. And, you know, I'm not here to argue with you. I mean, I'm, I'm past that. And a lot of people are past that. What you do have to know is if you don't start delving into the actual Hebrew, there are things that you're just not going to understand. And it may be quite important if in the last days when, you, when judgment is upon us, you want to know who this prophecy is really talking about. And it may not be who you think it's talking about. You follow? So, you know, be careful. But anyways, well... Continue on. But everybody thinks they know. But just common sense says, hey, you, you have to, you can't just say I'm accepting this but not that because you will not get the prophecy right and you'll be caught up in whatever madness uh, occurs at the time. To get the prophecy right, and in, in order to get the prophecy right, you need to come to this conclusion. These scriptures were written in Hebrew to the Hebrews, specifically the Israelites. And you have to read them from that perspective to really start understanding. You can't come in there reading it as a Gentile because I'm going to tell you, if you read those scriptures, it, it called, basically, it called the Gentiles a bucket of warm spit, basically. So this was written to the Israelites. And it says the Israelites, their names were written in the book of life. 
It didn't say the Gentiles' names were written in the book of life. It said that the Israelites could have their names blotted out, you know, if they were doing wickedness. And it also said that the Gentiles could have their names added in. So if you just see the format there, it's the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, their names were automatically put in. But as they fell, their names could be blotted out. The Gentiles, their names weren't in the book of life, but it could be added in through faith in the Messiah. And a lot of people don't want to hear that. I get it. But um, that's where these churches go wrong. They keep using this replacement theology, like somehow they're replacing Israel. And it's a kind of an arrogant outlook. And that's going to come back and bite a lot of people because you're not replacing Israel. You could be grafted into Israel through faith in the Messiah, but you have not replaced Israel. And that's why in the book of 2 Ezra, chapter 6, uh, verse 9, it talks about the kingdom of Jacob, Israel, right? It doesn't say the kingdom of the Gentiles. In fact, the times of the Gentiles will end so that the kingdom of Israel can manifest. So keep that in mind. Y'all keep going down that path and see where it gets you. Y'all keep believing these pastors. That, man trying to tell you something. You better read it for yourself if you can. And if you can't, you know, pray. The Most High will send you signs so that you can seek more clearly. And you can see there's a, it, these churches today are money-making rackets. Reminds me of that book of Eli. You know, everybody wanted that Bible. The good guys and the bad guys. The bad guys recognizing wholeheartedly that anybody who possesses knowledge of that book can control the people. So that evil, the evil guy in the book of Eli was like, you know, that movie I'm talking about, you know, with Denzel Washington. Anybody, he was trying to get the book so he could learn better how to control the people. It's the words in that book that will control the people. And the good guys were like, yeah, we got to keep the book away from these guys. Because there's power in these words just like this power in the actual name of the most high. And yet people don't want, they don't want to know his name. You know what I'm saying? Like I say, how can you blaspheme the name of God if you don't know what his name is in the first place? And it ain't God. The Hebrew word would be El or Elohim for plural. And then you can get into what does it mean? Plural gods? Well, that's a whole nother, another story. We're going to get into that some more where you can read my book, God Through the Eyes of the Hebrews. It'll get you in the ballpark. Um, but here we go in uh, Wars of the Jews, book 7, chapter 5, verse 7. For he having now by providence a vast quantity of wealth, besides what he had formerly gained in his other exploits, he had this temple adorned with pictures and statues. For in this temple were collected and deposited all such rarities as men aforetime used to wander all over the habitable world to see when they had a desire to see one of them after another. So they had this temple, uh, I believe they erected this temple, or maybe it was already existing, but it became dedicated to all the spoils of war of precious objects and items that they could kind of warehouse them there. And so you would suspect, and here's Josephus, the Judean, talking about it. So he's obviously not talking about Chinese stuff. He's talking about their stuff. So he knew full well they had stored all these artifacts in this temple. So, you know, I find that fascinating. I don't know. Uh, do you find it fascinating? It, it tells you these things were still in existence at that point in time. So, again, uh, Wars of the Jews, book 7, chapter 5, verse 7. And uh, he continues. He also laid up therein those golden vessels and instruments that were taken out of the Jewish temple. Uh-huh. He's telling you flat out as ensigns of his glory. But still he gave order that they should lay up their law. 
Hmm. What does that mean? But still he gave order that they should lay up their law and the purple veils of the holy place. Aha. Okay. In the royal palace itself. So that stuff he took to his palace because it must have been really nice stuff, huh? And keep them there. And this is also, there's some symbolisms here. If you can, it, the Father in heaven, Father Yahweh, the Most High, allows this. Much like he allowed the Babylonians to take the vessel. You got to see the parallelisms here. He allowed the Babylonians to take the vessels, the golden cups. And they defiled those cups and uh, were getting drunk out of them. Think about it. The vessels of the Holy Temple were being used at a Babylonian party when people were drinking and getting drunk out of the vessels of the Most High. Just like uh, the, the, the whore that rides the beast. She's got a vessel. And she's Mystery Babylon, see? And she's drinking out of the vessels and she's drunk and made the, made the kings of the earth drunk with her. So here's the same kind of thing. The vessels have taken and now being stored, and some even in the palace itself. Well, you could say at least the Romans weren't getting drunk off the vessels. Uh, they put it in a temple, which is very interesting. It was almost like they had a little more reverence, unlike the Babylonians. But just like the Babylonians, they took the vessels. And so that's going to kind of and I've talked about it in other videos, Rome is the gatekeeper of the Babylonian system. To this day, if you can recognize Rome, you will, and, and, and the religious practices of Rome today, and I'm not talking about the little city, I'm talking about the Roman Empire of today. Okay? And look at their religious system it comes straight out of Babylon. So, but the Romans, the second go around, instead of, uh, you know, disgracing the, the cups or the, the vessels out of the temple, they, they themselves put it in a temple of their own making, right? So they don't, uh, it, it's like paying, only, in, a, in a way, it's like paying homage to the vessels but putting the vessels in their temple or their system. And I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, you know, you see what I'm saying. And we're going to do another video uh, to finally bring this, all this home. But the Roman, Romans with their Babylonian Zoroastrian system have collected all the vessels of the temple at Jerusalem and brought it into their temple. And there's a term for that, and we get into that a little later. Um, and you'll see what I'm talking about. From temple to temple, okay? From God's temple to the Babylonian temple, okay? Just keep that in the back of your mind, and this will start to make a little sense. So there's just a, a lot, lot to think about here. And then, like I say, it's, it's an arrow pointing to a certain way. And it's pointing to the Lateran Church in Rome. I don't know if some of you may have never heard of that. But remember, this is the Roman Empire as it progresses into the last days of the Roman Empire. Right? And what does that mean? You know? Um, so, okay, Lateran Church. Why did the 12th century canons at the Lateran Church of San Giovanni in Laterano um, in Rome claimed the presence of the Ark of the Covenant inside their altar. Wow. So there's an altar in the Lateran church and kind of under the altar there's another little altar or Ark of the Covenant if you will. So the Romans, the Roman Catholic church is had long claimed to have this ark, which would make sense because the papacy is an offshoot of the old Roman Empire. 
And so uh, a lot of people do understand the prophecies uh, of the, the, the two legs of iron, you know, in the statue of Jan- Daniel. But in the last days, this Roman Empire takes on a new form and is of ten toes. The number ten being interesting because the beast has ten horns, right? So in the days of those kings, right? So the Pope is now essentially in place of the Roman emperor. At, well, at a certain point, he, it kind of switches to a holy Roman Empire as opposed to a straight-up military Roman Empire, if, if that at all makes sense. But the, it's still the Roman Empire. And it takes on a form, and it still has control of these vessels. So one would think, from that one temple where they stored all these vessels, it just transferred to this new temple or this new place, which is now controlled by the papacy. So the Lateran Church is the is the focal point here. So what and and you know the church was big into getting artifacts because there was a, a they were trying they were legitimizing their claim. Okay, so let's read this. The claim responded to new challenges in, in thereafter of the First Crusade in 1099. The Christian possession of Jerusalem questioned the legitimation of the papal cathedral in Rome as the summit of sacerdotal representation. So the church in Rome, once they had these crusades and, and these warriors from Europe get to Jerusalem and they realize, yeah, wow, this is where it all started, not Rome. And so now the papacy had to, had to uh, do damage control real quick. So the idea was to bring as much of the artifacts as they can back. And so what they want, want to say, there, there's a transformation or a translation from the temple at Jerusalem to the temple at Rome. You see, so what they, they're not saying... Unlike other conquering people, they're not saying that uh, that this was like the, the temple in Jerusalem was fake or anything. They're giving it legitimacy. What they're trying to do, which is what Satan tries to do, instead of just uh, being obvious with his stuff, Babylon, Babel means confusion. So all you have to do is sprinkle in a little bit of impurity, a little bit of lie. You can change the whole meaning of something, which is more subtle, which is more like the serpent, right? You know, so just things to think about. It's, it's, they're just transferring the power from Jerusalem to Rome. And this is all going to come together in the next video. Uh, I think it's fascinating and it makes total sense to me. I'm just trying to get this information out so maybe people could see where it, you know, where all this goes and what, who's who and what's what and why we're here in the situation we're in now. So let's continue. To meet this challenge, what may be described as translatio templi, the transfer of the temple, was used to strengthen the status of the Lateran. The Ark of the Covenant was central as part of the treasure from, Jerus- from the Jerusalem temple allegedly transported to Rome and according to contemporary accounts depicted on the Ark of Titus. And the Ark of Titus still exists today. We're going to show a picture of it. And etched in it, and very clear, it was a very well done job. It shows the Roman soldiers carrying out captives from Jerusalem. It shows them carrying out what is unmistakably the menorah out of the temple. And then following along, there's another box. I wonder what that box could be. But they're showing it, and it's still in existence today. If you go there, and you could go through the Ark of Titus, and it's it stood the, the test of time. It's still there. And they're saying, yeah, we got all this stuff out the temple. The Roman emperors did, and just passed it on, you know, because the Roman beast has existed and will exist to the last day. Until, until Hamashiach re- returns to personally destroy that empire. It will not be destroyed by any other empire. It will rule till the end. And so you could see where these artifacts, 
were just moved from one place to another. It's still the Roman Empire. They didn't, they weren't in, you know, I can't, let's just say it emphatically states that the Romans had these things and now the papacy is in control of Rome at this point, right? So I wonder where all these artifacts are. And Rome was known, the papacy was known to collect these artifacts to fulfill what they call translatio templi. So here's the Arch of Titus, um, really a beautiful monument. And so, uh, you know, you can just gather where the Ark may be. And so, I'm going to leave it at that. And uh, let's just uh, let's just say there's a chance that the Ark is still alive and well. So. Keep your eyes open. Well, I think that's going to do it for today. Um, I love you all so much. Thank you so much for continually supporting my content. If you did enjoy this video, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell, and share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they find it interesting as well. And I'm excited to continue this journey with you. I thank you all for bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated with certain events around the world. And have a blessed day in Yahusha HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Shalom.